Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Everything's Connected, a dialogue on the Internet of Medical Things, IOMT. We'll be talking about the opportunities, challenges, and data related to the rapidly expanding collection of Internet-connected devices and applications that connect patients with providers. I'm Dr. Rasu Shrestha, Chief Innovation Officer at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, UPMC, and Executive Vice President at UPMC Enterprises, the UPMC arm that's dedicated to reinventing healthcare through innovation, entrepreneurship, and commercialization. I'll be a moderator for today's webinar. This webinar is the first in a two-part series brought to you by the Center for Connected Medicine a digital healthcare executive briefing center, and a center of excellence around thought leadership in innovation and the future of patient care. The Center for Connected Medicine is jointly operated by GE Healthcare, IBM, Lenovo Health, Nokia, and UPMC. I'm delighted to be joined today by leading experts in healthcare information technology, which, may, uh, which you may hear us refer to as HIT, as it's commonly called throughout this discussion. Our experts hail from distinct, interesting sectors of the digital healthcare ecosystem. Our panelists are on the front lines of connected medicine, so really proud to have our panelists here today. Today, um, they will share their unique perspectives on how IOMT impacts the companies they lead and the solutions they've contributed to the digital healthcare landscape. These leaders will, will also join us for what I hope will be a really interesting tweet chat immediately following the webinar. So we can answer listener questions and continue the conversation on in, in the Twitter sphere. Tweet your questions to hashtag IOMT chat. So that's I-O-M-T-C-H-A-T to join the dialogue. So let's begin. It's with great pleasure to have, us, have with us uh, Greg Pesson. Greg's a research director in Gartner's Healthcare Provider Research Group. Gartner, as all of you may know, is a leading information technology research and advisory company. We're also joined by Eric Rock, founder and CEO of Vivify Health, the first cloud-based remote care management platform connecting providers with their patients via wireless mobile devices, I want to make a brief transparency disclaimer to mention that UPMC Enterprises is indeed an investor in Vivify Health, and UPMC does indeed use Vivify technology for remote patient monitoring. And then I have Tom Foley. Tom is Director of Global Health Solutions Strategy at Lenovo Health. Uh, Lenovo Health is a uh, health information technology company that works to deliver technology that answers problems of today and tomorrow's care. Lenovo is a partner at the Center for Connected Medicine. Today, we'll take an in-depth look at the IOMT environment. We'll review real-world solutions that are currently available to patients and providers and, un and unpack what the data says about virtual care. We'll examine hospital workflows, remote patient monitoring, telemedicine, and the medical home. We'll consider these topics through the lens of data management, patient satisfaction, efficiency, privacy, interoperability, and cybersecurity. To begin, I'd like to introduce Greg Pesson. Greg is a research director in the healthcare provider group at Gartner. His focus is on technology that supports real-time healthcare system, or uh, as it's commonly referred to, RTHS, including clinical communications, IOMT, mobility, cloud services, security, and compliance. Greg, welcome to the webinar. Yeah. Thanks, Rasun. Thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to participate today. Thanks, Greg. Greg, we know that you have an incredibly rich understanding of the IOMT environment. I promise that we're going to go deeper, but can you kick us off today by sharing how you define IOMT? Sure, yeah. The uh, Internet of Medical Things uh, is a subset of IoT that pertains to health and wellness information collection. There is some overlap with other IoT subsets, especially in the wearable space, but for the most part, it describes things that healthcare organizations use to gather information about a patient in the healthcare delivery environment. 
I like to think about it in terms of data collected inside the walls of a healthcare facility and data from outside the healthcare facility. Inside the walls are an array of clinically certified medical devices, a variety of RTLS type technologies and environmental condition monitoring technologies for tissue and blood banks, for example. Outside the walls, we can think about IOMT in terms of patient-centric devices and wearables that are in the home or on the person, uh, maybe in their car. They're uh, a mix of clinical and non-clinical things, including uh, wearables like smart watches or fitness bands. IOMT is more than just the edge devices collecting data from the real world. It also includes IoT platform technologies that provide the connections and interfaces that allow all of the transmitted data to be funneled and presented up for analysis by IoT analytics engines. These three groups of technologies make up the Internet of Medical Things. Uh, that's a really good overview of uh, IOMT, Greg, uh, done uh, as only Gartner can do. So that was, that was brilliant. Um, Greg, what are some tangible benefits of IOMT? So when you put all the collected data together that I mentioned previously, the, the benefits of IOMT all come to life. Having this holistic view of what's going on with a patient, including information from their home and life environment prior to the point where they visit their primary care physician or go to an emergency department, it creates a more informed place to begin the diagnostic and treatment paths for the patient. This informed place uh, is built by analytics engines that put the data together from all the various IOMT sources and comparing and correlating it to the records of millions of other patients. These engines make it easier for caregivers to make the right decisions for the patient's health. From a higher perspective, this collection and analysis of IOMT data and then the feeding the analytics results back into the healthcare delivery organization is foundational to the real-time health system platform. The platform and framework is all about combining the data, systems, and workflows within an HDO to assist the caregivers in making the right decisions at the right time and place to maximize the health benefits to the patient. That's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to quickly touch on UPMC activity that further illustrates some of the points that Greg just made. You know, by way of background, uh, it's important to understand that UPMC is an integrated uh, delivery and healthcare finance system. We are a provider of healthcare and have over 25 hospitals within our network. We're also a pair. Our insurance uh, services division operates the UPMC Health Plan, which has over 3 million members. And we're an academic and research institution with one of the largest academic programs in the United States with 1,800 fellows and residents in training. From this vantage point, what we've seen are a couple of really interesting things around IOMT and telemedicine and virtual care. Telemedicine has become an, an increasingly popular uh, entity. UPMC first offered telemedicine in um, 20, uh, 2006 to stroke and psychiatric patient populations. Today, we have 35 telemedicine specialty services available across multiple locations, and we've completed over 23,000 telehealth visits last year. Dr. Pamela Peel, who's the uh, Chief Analytics Officer of UPMC's Health Plan, delivered the opening keynote address at the recent American Telehealth Association annual conference, which I know many of us and many of our listeners attended, and she touched on this remarkable transformation. Telemedicine is popular amongst consumers because of savings and time. We calculated uh, at UPMC that between June 2012 and December 2015, telemedicine saved at UPMC our patients 603,412 miles uh, in dollar amounts, uh, $315,744 in travel costs, and 10,391 hours in travel time, which is just remarkable. It's attractive to UPMC as a provider of health care because our physicians are committed to providing exceptional patient care. We're determined to lead the industry in terms of innovation that makes care more convenient for patients and that provides an accommodating experience for all of our consumers. As telemedicine is popular amongst payers because it has been proven to reduce costs, for example, UPMC Anywhere Care, our telemedicine platform, 
has a savings per episode of care of $86.64. That's why we're continually expanding Anywhere Care. It was launched in November 2013 and relaunched in November 2016, becoming an all-video visit interaction um, and allowing for a native app to be downloaded by consumers. Both launches were a collaboration between UPMC Health Services and UPMC Health Plan. You know, what's really interesting is as care moves from bricks and mortar facilities to people's homes, to their smartphones, and to their connected devices, care models will evolve from supply to demand-based systems, where 24-7 availability and ubiquitous digital data-based interactions become the new norm. So thanks for letting me add some color to the benefits that Greg mentioned. As important as the benefits are the hurdles to IOMT. Some of these hurdles are universal and some are unique to function. For example, in her ATA keynote address, Dr. Peel talked about telemedicine cost and uh, the availability to prove value. Her perspective as a health economist is always invaluable. However, regardless of function, we all know real and complex challenges threaten our ability to maximize the potential of IOMT. In fact, the IOMT environment of today reminds me of the EMR environment 15 years ago, disjointed, groups thinking in silos without an understanding or agreement on bigger picture. Uh, let's come back to you, Greg. Greg, do you mind, would you talk to us about some of the challenges uh, surrounding IOMT? Sure. So um, the challenges in, of implementing IOMT for the most part are centered on the, the patient data that's collected by the edge devices. Uh, from a privacy perspective, the same policies and laws that dictate how hospitals handle PHI apply directly to IOMT. And that means protection of all the data collected in physical infosec type protections need to be in place for the devices themselves. Uh, so that's a challenge. The edge devices present a new attack or threat vector for entry into hospitals' IoT infrastructures. The, IoT, the IOMT devices themselves act more like uh, human users than devices in the past. They can not only observe the physical world, but they can also take action in some cases. Um, IT identity and access management systems need to allow for this new kind of user population. In, the, uh, in this early stage of maturity for IOMT, uh, hospitals are faced with several data issues. The first is trying to correlate the IoT platform, uh, to correlate at the IoT platform level all of the various data sources into a normalized form so that the data can be correlated and analyzed accurately. Um, being able to verifiably identify which data came from which patient is a harder task than it may seem on the surface. And that's just within the walls of the hospital. When considering bringing data from home-based IOMT together with clinical IOMT data, the problem grows exponentially. Are you sure that the patient's grandchild when visiting their home didn't put their arm into that BP cuff and take a dozen readings that are now associated with the grandparent? And, and finally, with the prevalence of wearable devices comes the issue of data accuracy. Clinical devices are approved and certified, and, and typically they follow a calibration protocol to ensure accuracy. Consumer-grade consumer wearables are, aren't burdened by those requirements, and they're only driven by customer requirements. And in the long term, I predict um, the, the consumer devices will approach clinical accuracy levels, but uh, that, we've got a little bit to wait before that happens. Greg, that was a remarkable overview of the IOMT challenges. Thank you for that. Um, you know, the challenges around IOMT is something that, um, you know, we really want to delve uh, a little deeper into here because it affects all of us. Uh, Tom, I know that you have some brief thoughts on, on the challenges around IOMT. Do you care to elaborate on that? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I, the one thing that I would add to uh, this particular list is, uh, is usability. And ultimately, uh, uh, and as we talk about usability, how we uh, uh, how we address the other uh, other challenges. Uh, at the end of the day, I think of my 82 year old mother, uh, and and using uh, and being in a medical home, um, and uh, having these devices, and, and how 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 the patient can actually adopt this technology, 
and uh, and use it in a, in a meaningful way. So I, I think that that's a, a one of the other elements that we, we should focus on as an industry. Uh, thanks, Tom. That, uh, you're you're spot on. Um, you know, I have a I have a question for Eric. Um, Eric, uh, are there any lessons learned from the first wave of digitization in healthcare that you think can be applied to IOMT? Uh, of course, Rasu. Thank you. And um, you know, as IOMT devices begin to proliferate, it's become critically important to make sense of all this data, enable care teams with tools that incorporate intelligent algorithms. You know, the goal here is to reduce the noise of all of this data and the associated clinical effort. We cannot scale services without that. Otherwise, these care teams would simply overreact to the numerous alerts that can come from all of this raw IoT data. Often that's just dumped into EMRs and, and there's no tools or guidance for them. Thus, that intelligent cloud-based software layer uh, is very important to manage all of this data efficiently. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Greg, for uh, a brilliant overview of uh, IOMT because it's really important to establish uh, just, just the framework of what IOMT is all about. So I want to get a little more granular, granular into a, a popular component of IOMT. So we're going to turn away from challenges and lessons learned. However, please go ahead and tweet your questions or comments to hashtag IOMTChat. So that's hashtag I-O-M-T-C-H-A-T. And we'll connect on this topic for further discussion in our tweet chat immediately following the conclusion of this webinar. Uh, now I want to turn to Eric Rock, CEO and founder of Vivify Health. Vivify is used by healthcare organizations representing over 600 hospitals and health plans. Prior to Vivify, Eric founded Medhost, which produced the first uh, touchscreen EMR and other innovations. Eric, how has IOMT had an impact on Vivify Health and on the growth of remote patient monitoring? Yeah, Rasu, thanks for the introduction. Uh, Vivify simply wouldn't exist without IOMT. These devices are critical to what we can accomplish with continual care for patients outside the four walls. And so when we look at how we're changing the landscape of healthcare, we focus on traditional healthcare, which is episodic, which happens in the form of a visit to your doctor's office, a clinic, or worst case, and what we're all trying to avoid is that costly visit to the hospital. So with IOMT, we're enabling an entirely new type of healthcare, again, continual, um, where we can leverage these biometric devices, activity sensors, and more capabilities that are being provided to mobile devices, phones, tablets, even televisions. And so uh, applying all this with intelligent algorithms and telemedicine enables this new type of care. And when we look at the platform that you see on the slide here today, this can be accomplished with pure software. So these IoT devices that we speak of, uh, they're being manufactured by fantastic companies like Lenovo that are creating, um, as we've already heard to some degree, these devices that become transparent in the background uh, and to manage all of that data that's coming in so quickly, a software platform can really deliver an experience to the care team that's needed um, in an end-to-end -end digital health workflow that integrates through all levels and most importantly engages the patients in a way that's meaningful uh, to those patients. And that may be through um, their existing smartphone, a tablet, uh, wearables, and even television experiences behind this. And, you know, lastly, even interactive voice response. So if all else fails, we can always reach them through even their old landline phone. Uh, so, uh, but one area that we've discovered is quite important. A lot of these patients that are uh, elderly and often the most expensive for the care that we offer, they're very fearful of technology. And so the application of a managed kit, or that is a tablet with the appropriate IoT devices all built in, has been a critical component to impacting those that are uh, most fragile, most costly to uh, the environment. And so for that population, having things like an um, instant-on solution that has a welcome video that's warming that is from the message of that provider, and things like text-to-speech so that uh, for that 80-year-old, 90-year-old, and even north of 100-year-old, it's talking to them. It's a comfortable experience, and they quickly get past that fear of technology. But there's also security considerations as well in all of these, and particularly in that managed kit, 
to have a locked down environment. So uh, it's not just an app that you download or web or other experience, but it's one that truly is uh, dedicated to that specific function. So having those tablets locked down and the ability for uh, technology support organizations to remotely control that tablet and solve any problems. That's been another barrier in the growth of IoT and remote monitoring is the simplicity of the deployment from a care team's perspective. The technology has just been too difficult. Tom reflected on that briefly earlier. And so that usability is a critical factor. Um, and you know, the end result is we have to get patients to uh, truly engage. Um, you know, what we've accomplished is over 90% daily engagement regardless of that age and regardless of their comfort level of technology, but also for those that are the power users of these phones and wearables and, and accomplish um, their engagement as well. Both are difficult, the elderly from fear of technology, the young because they think they don't need health care. <laughs> so to manage that all is important. And, you know, with all of this, of course, things like virtual visits and these biometric devices are now commonplace in the market, uh, but at the center of it all is that Pathways portal that monitor you see that the care team uses, which is the command and control for healthcare providers making that transition from episodic or fee-for-service to value-based, as we call it, continual care. That's great, um, and, and thank you. And, and I know you're doing some remarkable things in, in intelligent remote patient monitoring, as you just described. You know, what hurdles remain for remote patient monitoring to grow beyond only high-risk populations? Um, you know, Rossi, before I go there, if I'd like to elaborate a little further on, uh, you know, the platform and some of the individual capabilities. And with that, uh, we have things such as uh, those algorithms that reduce the noise uh, for enabling efficient care across uh, large populations. Um, uh, more importantly, behind that, these algorithms are condition-specific. We have nearly 100 of these that guide the patient on a daily basis to successfully manage their own care. This, of course, incorporates experiences so those IoT devices can be used simply. But in addition, things like questions that are asked or health surveys that are very specific to where they are in their pathway and condition specific. And additionally, things like educational videos and tips um, and moments of congratulations that they've accomplished a goal that has been mutually set between the patient and the care team towards their outcomes. Um, and those pathways to really provide outcomes, they have to be often evidence-based. You, you have to truly um, assure through experience and partnerships, like, uh, for example, we've had with the American Heart Association, we created uh, some evidence-based pathways specific to cardiovascular conditions that uh, following 10, 20 years of their organizations deep dive into that data and how can they engage patients meaningfully. Uh, that has been applied as an example of evidence-based pathways. So combining that IOMT data with these pathways tells a real-time story of the patient's daily health, and that's been missing. Um, and then lastly is the population of patients monitored increases. The cost of IOMT devices has come down as the market's scaling. And this has just begun to happen, um, putting us at the forefront of this rapid growth with a, a time-tested and outcome-proven platform. And, and Rossi, your, your last question, uh, you're referring to hurdles that remain. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 to provide an example of that, um, this slide shows uh, the view of uh, a good analogy is like a Doppler radar scanning these medical devices um, across, uh, you know, no geographic boundary. So this provides the ability to look in real time at what is happening with these patients. And regardless of what that data set is, regardless if it's blood pressure, weight, you know, the simple basics, but also into the depths of activity sensing, uh, things that we can sense through IOMT devices that we can see emotions changing, um, and, and any indicator that might be uh, a decline in health in any way. And so with this, no geographical boundaries exist. It enables care anywhere, anywhere and most importantly, outside the four walls of the hospital where it just costs too much. And through, through this hot spotting, as I'll call it, a very small team of caregivers can now easily manage a large population across uh, a broad geography. In fact, those care team members don't have to be behind any four walls. They themselves can be working from their own homes as a team effort. You know, however, there, uh, there are um, 
a few hurdles that remain uh, per your question. And one of the biggest hurdles is, of course, the reimbursement considerations, which are changing very rapidly. We're seeing our own government drive this. But also providers are overwhelmed. So the, the doctors and nurses that are starting to apply these technologies, no matter how badly they want to and they're so excited about you know, the innovation that's coming, when they get right down to it, they're overwhelmed with their current role of episodic care and those visits that come into their office, and they're not often prepared for the, the time needed uh, for this. And so it's our mission to make that easier and easier to deploy and reduce their work effort at the time. And so all of this really is a complex transition for encounter-based care organizations to make that transition to continual care models. So it often requires organizational changes um, as these clinical resources are scarce and applied only where reimbursement exists today. Uh, thus, new models require new organizational structures. You know, uh, Eric, as a radiologist by by training, I love the uh, the notion of Doppler radar scanning, and uh, and I think they're spot on here in terms of how that applies to IOMT, and then the hot spotting that you mentioned. I think that's that's just remarkable as well. Um, Eric, what are the benefits of remote patient monitoring to health systems today, and with the scaling that IOMT may help uh, to provide? Very good, and so in this picture here will um, hopefully you know, give you a thousand words in which to see what's really happening when you look at a, a model of scaling. This is a picture of we're looking at six nurses backed by pharmacists and doctors as needed and back into the four walls of the health system that are taking that Doppler radar and engaging immediately with patients um, as needed. And so you can see here the true scale behind just a very few people managing thousands of patients. Um, and then, uh, of course, escalating in uh, evidence-based protocols for escalation and interventions through virtual visits directly with the patient or phone calls, if that's the better path. Um, and, of course, looking at everything that's, that's happening in real time with these patients. Um, so they are seeing, as a result of this, benefits such as a reduction of over 50% in acute utilization and costs, that is readmissions, ED visits, um, admissions, all of it, uh, across our customer base, well over 50%, some uh, even close to 80 90% reduction in those costs. So there's a hard ROI when there's a value behind it or a value-based model where they're taking the risk or costs associated with the patient, but it goes way beyond those hard ROI benefits. It also goes into the soft benefits. The patient satisfaction scores skyrocket. And regardless of their age, this is healthcare as they imagined it many years ago. So we're now going back into the home, uh, thanks to IoT, and uh, in a way that doctors can be doctors again, and we can scale and deliver care in a meaningful way. And, and Rosso, I know that you've got some experience at UPMC with Vivify. Perhaps you could share some of your outcomes and experiences that you've seen with Vivify. Um, thanks, Eric. I, I love the notion of doctors becoming doctors again, and uh, you're absolutely spot on. You know, at UPMC, um, you know, I'd mentioned earlier that uh, we uh, at UPMC Enterprises are an investor in Vivify Health, and that Vivify facilitates remote patient monitoring for certain UPMC patient populations. Specifically, um, as Eric mentioned, uh, UPMC is using Vivify to care for a subset of populations here. We, we're targeting congestive heart failure patients, uh, advanced illness care patients, uh, smoking cessation patients, and, uh, and even inflammatory bowel disease patients. We've seen tremendous patient satisfaction and compliance rates with remote patient monitoring at UPMC. The average uh, patient satisfaction and compliance rates are truly remarkable. Uh, UPMC has achieved a compliance rate of 92% versus the average of 78%, which I think is just remarkable. And UPMC has also achieved a patient satisfaction rate of over 92%, and it's increasing, it's trending upwards as well. So clearly, um, you know, the, the notion of everything that Eric, you just described around IOMT and the things that Vivify Health is doing has made a, a remarkable impact to what we're seeing at UPMC. So thank you for that. Um, so, thank you, Eric, and I really want to talk more about IOMT as it relates to how patients live and to their lives at home. 
Tom Foley, as I briefly mentioned earlier, is Director of Global Health Solutions Strategy at Lenovo Health, and Tom is with us today. Lenovo is well known as a maker of remarkable hardware. Tom's team works to consider how existing and yet to be invented hardware, devices, and applications can improve patient care. An area Tom spends a lot of time thinking about is also the smart medical home. Tom, um, how do you see IOMT technology integrating with the smart medical home? Well, first, uh, thank you uh, uh, for having me. Uh, the uh, the home, as we move from a volume to value-based care model, the home, as mentioned earlier, actually becomes a setting of care in and of itself. We often say at Lenovo Health, the patient has to be seen by the doctor. They don't necessarily have to go to the doctor. And, and that and that applies in uh, many use cases, but not all use cases. But uh, relative to uh, IOMT in the home, when that home becomes a setting of care, I, I need to be able to do some basic uh, measuring of vitals and be able to communicate uh, those vitals uh, to uh, store for myself as well as uh, share with my with my uh, with my entire care team. So it's not just about the devices. It's about uh, the connectivity uh, of the device in and of itself in that home. How does that data get uh, aggregated and 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 ultimately uh, shared uh, in in the uh, with the again the extended uh, care team? And then as well, the way we see it, uh, you know, the devices in and of themselves today is. Is is, uh, is is an interesting uh, proposition in and of itself. I could, you know, the average Medicare patient has five chronic conditions, and if you're going to manage it from a chronic care perspective, that could uh, then create a lot of different devices uh, in, and of, uh, in and of itself in the home for that patient to use. So, therefore, usability needs to be, as I mentioned earlier, needs to be very critical relative to how do I get these devices connected in a very easy way. As well, the, the devices in and of themselves, uh, you know, the keyboards and pressing buttons may not be the most adequate and, and productive way for uh, an elderly uh, consumer to uh, to participate and engage. Uh, and hence one of the reasons why Lenovo themselves uh, partnering with uh, with Amazon uh, is, uh, is launched a, an intelligent assistant uh, where we use the, uh, the the Amazon Alexa platform and created uh, several health skills in order for that consumer to be able to step on that scale and, and talk to Alexa and say, hey, my weight was, or Alexa can determine based on the wireless connectivity that the weight was and record and repeat that back uh, to the consumer for the consumer to confirm and then share with with uh, uh, you know store it in the local repository and share it with the with the care team. So the idea of some level of patient identity to some degree could be a confirmation through voice uh, versus you know having the grandchild over and someone stepping on that scale and it being automated uh, automatically recorded. There's just several different aspects uh, to that. And then, and then sec secondarily, you know, longer term, as we look at the IOMT world, we we think that the device itself might be uh, the antiquated uh, component to uh, to the solution. If I were to uh, ultimately identify you based on uh, everyone actually has a unique heartbeat, as an example. Uh, if I were, was I, if I was able to identify you based on a heartbeat, and and then be able to take uh, your vitals uh, without actually having devices in hand, um, that would be, which is actually possible uh, uh, through uh, new technology. Um, uh, that would be kind of how we see ultimately. The IOMT world shaping out in the next uh, two to three years uh, relative to how uh, we can address all those uh, challenges, most of those challenges that we we talked about earlier, and moving the market forward in a very engaging uh, manner. Uh, that's great, Tom. I I love the concept of the smart uh, medical home 
and, and, and this transformation that we're seeing before our very eyes where care venues in large parts are moving away from the bricks and mortar hospitals now directly to uh, the patients in our consumers' homes. Um, Tom, which IOMT devices do you think have the biggest impact on virtual care delivery, both in the home and ambulatory settings, and why? So the, uh, it's an interesting question in and of itself. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it, it comes down to the basics. And it comes down to what are the most prevalent chronic conditions, uh, for the most part, uh, that are that are out there, and therefore what devices are uh, applicable to the, uh, to address those particular uh, use cases. So the uh, you know the, the the scale, the blood pressure cuff, glucose monitor, uh, uh, insulin pump, uh, even the IV hookups in the home, and the stethoscope. Uh, one would say, hey, you know, the doctor typically has that around the neck. Uh, but there's no reason why uh, you couldn't plug a stethoscope into your smartphone and take a recording and and actually have that recording uh, uh, moved into a to a repository and shared with the team. But it but it, it also goes beyond the clinical uh, uh, aspect of it. When you take a look at the medical home, there's other there's other needs of that consumer that uh, that um, not only the consumer but the consumer's care team that uh, that are important. So understanding, you know, even uh, as I said earlier, how do we engage these devices? You know, sometimes you know, that keyboard is a tough thing to maneuver. Uh, maybe I just I can leverage the the, the voice that I got and, and and engage it in a very simple and user and user friendly way. But at the same time, there's other devices. You know, is there motion in the house? What's the temperature of the house? Is the house secure? And leveraging the, the smartphone, which is really uh, a very powerful device uh, these days. Um, and uh, ultimately becoming uh, that that hub, if you will, uh, that communication hub in the home that actually allows connectivity with all these different devices and uh, for uh, loved ones and the consumer to actually monitor the condition of the home as well as the condition of the patient to maximize that uh, that, that those patient outcomes. Yeah, that's great, and we're seeing a remarkable transformation, even in terms of, you know, the devices themselves and and how software and intelligence interplays with those devices. So thank you for those insights, Tom. Tom, as a leader representing a device maker, what steps do you think the healthcare industry should take to ensure standardization and interoperability in IOMT? Well, there are many uh, uh, going along the uh, the previous uh, discussion around what are the challenges with uh, IOMT uh, today. You could ultimately apply that to uh, some of the lingering challenges that the health IT market has relative to things that we need to settle on uh, in order to expand and further transform this market. If you, if you think about it, you know this market is only seven years old relative to the idea of actually doing the transformation, adopting health IT. It's only after the High Tech Act in 2008, 2009 that that actually became real. And then the, the motion started more so towards the end, end of nine and into 2010. So we're a very young industry relative to the leveraging of technology but uh, but as as we said there's there's still a number of different challenges i personally think and as i've spoken about many times before you know unique patient uh, uh identifier is 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 the fundamentals of interoperability if you and we and we have that challenge today with health it uh with duplicate records medical identity theft uh huge cost to the system and creating huge huge uh, number of uh, clinical impacts based on the, the quality of data. Uh, so we certainly have to give that, address that issue. And, and as you may have uh, read, uh, recently HIMSS and 20-some other organizations have uh, sent a letter to uh, Congress uh, in, in recent days uh, specifically calling for the need for the private sector to uh, address this uh, particular problem. And uh, so with that, uh, once I have patient identity, certainly uh, the interoperability, everybody talks about an interoperability challenge. 
I don't necessarily think that there's an interoperability challenge on the, on, the, on the basic constructs of it because we can pass data. We have tons of standards, and we can pass data all day long uh, between different systems. We, we just don't understand the data. And I, and I say here on the slide, it's not really about the exchange of the data. It's about understanding the data that is exchanged uh, that is critical uh, in the interoperability uh, segment. And it actually prevents, you know, Greg mentioned earlier the ability to put data together to create a digital view. It, this uh, this uh, lack of semantic interoperability actually prevents us from actually achieving that, uh, that, that, that objective, uh, which I think is, again, uh, very critical. And then a relative to interoperability and how do we exchange data, uh, the, the, the industry seems to be um, uh, have adopted uh, more so point-to-point -point type of protocols, even though direct messaging is out there from a, a transitions of care and meaningful use uh, construct, but it's not really the prevalent uh, uh, platform. So my view, as I say here, you know, point-to-point uh, -point protocols are really harmful for the delivery of care. And I, and I say that in the context of uh, I, I, am, I, I, I grew up in New Jersey. I, um, I, I, I go to Philadelphia for services. I go local for services. And I go to New York for services. And, and I might, um, and, uh, and if it was my mother-in-law, she's a snowbird, so she might uh, be down in Florida for six months out of the year. It's got a whole different set of doctors down there. If I don't, if, if my care team in New Jersey doesn't have an HL7 interface to uh, to a uh, to a care provider in Florida, um, I, or even a fire connection between the two, I can't. They can't exchange data, and that that becomes harmful to me uh, as the patient. Uh, the, uh, so I think that it is very critical that we look at a uh, enhance the one-to-many model. Um, whether it be uh, direct messaging in a, in a more uh, uh, structured manner or uh, another, but uh, we certainly need to move towards a, a one-to-many uh, model to to affect uh, the the behaviors and the, and the mobility of the of the patient uh, versus uh, the connectivity the, uh, hospitals have with uh, local partners. Yeah, uh, great, great points there. Um, you know, I, I want to pull in Eric uh, into this. Uh, Eric, I know you have some thoughts around this. Uh, would you mind sharing those with us? Absolutely. Thank you. And I absolutely agree with Tom as well. Portability combined with security is a significant factor in the scalability of this care utilizing IOMT, thus utilizing things like mobile devices with integrated sensors and the amazing sensors that Tom had described that are it's going to be uh, behind the scenes and everywhere we live and, and um, work. Those are all important components, and they solve a portion of the problem. Another consideration is that convenience and simplicity, which is the key to continual engagement and ultimately outcomes. So that has to carry, as Tom said, across all of these. But the bigger challenge, uh, and I think this reflects on what Tom was saying, is the exchange of data across health information systems. Um, it's been you know, very difficult uh, over the decades and significant progress, however, has been made recently, uh, things such as scalable SaaS or cloud-based platforms that truly can now help to deliver the provider side of things globally and even the patient experiences. But also we have seen just recently new interoperability standards, uh, things such as FHIR, the acronym F-H-I-R, that uh, has been pushed by the government and uh, with Meaningful Use 3 is now requiring the large EMR, EMR vendors to allow that data to be exposed. This is the data that is being collected behind the four walls within those EMRs. And when you combine that with this IoT data and what we see now daily in the home, you have a well-defined picture of the patient that you now have um, you know, these government drivers such as Meaningful Use 3 and the ability with FHIR to give it a true structure that can be exchanged across the different information systems. And in my 20 plus years in healthcare IT, this is very exciting times. I mean, it truly gives me goosebumps uh, for our ability to scale healthcare in an efficient and meaningful way to both patients and providers. That's great. Tom, um, what, what are your thoughts on that and, uh, and further thoughts on standardization and interoperability? 
Yeah, I uh, I couldn't agree more with uh, with what was just said. Uh, I want to add to that the the idea again going back to uh, Greg's uh, comment about putting all the data together to create a digital view. You know, we need to look at that in two ways. I think he was talking about it, and, and Greg can certainly uh, uh, correct me, but he was looking at it from a provider's perspective. I, I typically look at it from a consumer's perspective. So it's the same need, but I, too, when I collect all this data, it's not just about the need to collect the data and send it off to some someone else to look at. I want to I want to understand it, too. I want to understand those trends, and I want to understand why, you know, if I cross that red line, what, what does that mean? What should I do? Uh, if I'm a diabetic, should I stop eating that jelly donut type of thing? Uh, so, uh, so there's a number of different tools that we could have uh, at our disposal, for, at the consumer's disposal, that it can help them better understand their, beha their own behaviors. They, they certainly know what they're doing, but the, they don't know the impact, potentially, of what they're doing. And visually showing it to them and having educational tools uh, available are, are important. So the, the, the idea of consolidating that into my micro HIE uh, and 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 having tools to provide on-demand insights uh, is is very critical towards uh, towards the movement uh, of uh, patient engagement. The challenge that we have today is that if I go to a if I go to a health system, they typically have, or actually, let me back it up. If I if I I'm the average Medicare patient, I have five chronic conditions. I see nine different doctors. If, if, uh, I'm just going to blow this out of proportion. I'll just assume that you know some doctors are in Philadelphia, some doctors in New Jersey, some doctors are in uh, in New York City. Uh, in, in, in the example that I gave before, they might all use different EHRs. They actually then therefore all use different patient portals. I can't go to nine different patient portals. We have to solve that problem uh, and uh, and give patients one view uh, to their to their data. And uh, and as we move forward, uh, you know, it is very clear that health savings accounts are going to be a part of the uh, uh, potentially part of the new uh, healthcare. Actually, it's already a growing aspect of of healthcare today. So, giving uh, the consumer the ability to look at uh, how to manage their data, their their clinical data, as well as how to manage their 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 finances associated with healthcare. Uh, in a consolidated view uh, would be uh, really uh, something that is necessary in order for the consumers to be truly engaged and, and to be able to truly manage their health and help that care team uh, mitigate their risk uh, in a, in a value-based care model and achieve those outcomes that are necessary. And then uh, I think we mentioned it earlier, uh, you know, clinical guidelines. The idea of uh, having all this data and where do I send it to, and when do I send it, and data fatigue, and um, I think that we, uh, the, the clinical community can actually help in the idea of establishing clinical guidelines as to what is best, uh, what, what is best protocol. I know all doctors and, and care teams are different, but what are the best practices relative to when to send, when to hold uh, uh, that data relative to all the, the different data sets that are now collected in the medical home? And last but not least, I say uh, let's not repeat the VHS uh, versus Betamax uh, debate, and that really has to go to the to the idea that you know, there's so many standards out there. Uh, is is it, do do different standards really produce a very significant difference in what we're trying to achieve relative to collecting data and the efficiency of collecting that data? It, so uh, if I am a consumer, I don't want to have to you know I my home. I, I want a, I want a, uh, a blood pressure cup. I want a scale. I want uh, uh, you know a, 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 a glucose monitor. Do I have to worry about what protocol it supports? I, I'm not a technologist. Well, I am a technologist, but as a consumer, I'm I'm not. But the point there being is, I don't need to worry about you know is it VHS or is it Betamax. Let's let this industry uh, rally around the delivery of care versus rally around the, the passion that one might have about one one protocol or one interface versus the other. This is really, uh, you can build, you can have your baseline standards and you can build uh, your add-ons if, you, if you'd like, but uh, the baseline needs to be consistent in order for 
the consumer to truly engage um, and to embrace uh, the medical home and uh, and be a participant in that in that process versus needing to be a technician a, a technician in order to uh, uh, to manage that home. Well, thank you, Tom. That's uh, very insightful. You know, it's it's absolutely critical. We've established this. Uh, in, in hearing from, from Greg and Eric and, and Tom just now that it's critical for us to ensure that we get ahead of the challenges around data and device interoperability, around security and privacy and new care models as it relates to the Internet of Medical Things. Uh, Tom, thank you. And a big thank you to all of our participants for sharing your knowledge and perspective on such an enormous and truly significant topic in healthcare today. But we're not done yet. We'll continue our discussion on Twitter in just a moment. Uh, please tweet us your questions by including the hashtag uh, IOMT chat. So that's hashtag IOMT chat in your tweet. Uh, we hope to see you there momentarily. Um, I'd mentioned uh, at the beginning that this is the first in a two-part webinar series. Uh, so part two in the uh, Center for Connected Medicine's IOMT webinar series will focus on securing the network. It will feature a new cast of expert panelists, and, we won't, and you, you definitely won't want to miss it. Uh, please keep your eyes on the Center for Connected Medicine's uh, at Connected Med Twitter handle for information about the date and time. Thank you, and see you uh, in the Twitter sphere. I'm Dr. Rasu Shrestha, and you can find me on Twitter at Rasu Shrestha. Thank you very much.